right? Do you need a break here? I'm moving on. Um, yes and no. There are a number of techniques that different teachers teach, um, and there is even a small technique that I use on the master points, um, but for many years I did it without a technique, I just used my intent. Here's the goal of technique. The goal of technique is to, in, on the insertion of the master point, to take the a level of qi that is activated from ying qi to yuan qi. Accessing ying qi, like we're trained to do, is not enough. You have to access yuan qi. And so there are techniques that allow you to do that, but you can simply do that with your intent. You can say to yourself as you're needling lung seven, I'm not trying to descend lung qi or dispel wind cold, right? I'm I am inserting this point to open the Renmai. I want to access the deeper aspects of yin. That thought is enough to take the energy in. It is not about depth. You don't put the needle in deeper to get you in qi. It's about resonance. So um, the techniques support the resonance, but intent alone is enough. You just have to recognize that you're using this point differently than you normally use it. We're good? All right, so now we're going to look at what happens when people move through changes. So hang in there with this Western stuff. It's not as interesting, I think, but it sort of sets the groundwork for the choices that we might make. So definitions in terms of a puberty, this is a very powerful transitional state. You've all been through it. You know how powerful it is. It's crazy making time. Everything goes haywire and all these um, uh, new awarenesses show up and new physical things show up in your body. So it's a transitional period in a child's life that is about sexual maturation. So the body is preparing for fertility. It's preparing to leave a childhood state, childhood awarenesses, and move into a state that is capable of procreation. Um, and typically, we have evidence of this physically by the uh, changes or the development of secondary sexual characteristics, things like pubic hair, right, um, uh, acne. <laughs> things start to show up that are not typical of childhood, that are transitional in nature. The timing on this with the seven and eight year cycle varies dramatically and has changed over the last 20 years pretty dramatically. Um, it, it used to start, menses used to start much later and puberty, the symptoms of puberty started much later. Um, the average age in the early 1900s was about 15, and now um, in the late 1900s and the 2000s, it's, it was in 1990, 12, and now, as I was saying earlier, it can be as early as 11, 10, in some cultures, nine. So very early onset. In boys, it's typically between 12 and 16. The onset is, um, often influenced by genetics. So when your parents went through puberty is a good marker for when you'll likely go through puberty. But this is also altered by environment. So the input in the dietary and exposure realms of phytoestrogens and pesticides and all sorts of other things has had an impact on the hormonal system changing when puberty starts, body fat, can also change um, when puberty starts. So we don't, it's not a specific marker, it's more a zone, really. So we start to look for these secondary sexual characteristics in girls. We start to see budding of the breast, pubic hair, armpit hair, um, and somewhere in that process, women, uh, young girls will start their menstrual cycle. Um, 
rule of thumb is that a regular ovulation occurs pretty quickly after uh, menarche, but studies show um, that if the later your period starts, the more likelihood you'll have of irregular menses for a short period of time. So about 50% of the girls who start their periods after age 13 will have a four or five year struggle on getting that cycle to regulate. Um, you know, from a Western point of view, I don't really know what the science behind that is. Um, but, you know, I can look at that from an eight extra point of view and go back in someone's history from birth through the first 10, 12 years and see where the impediment is that is impacting the liver's ability to regulate cyclic events. Um, so it's just a, it's a pretty common thing to see that. In boys, you see an increase in testicular size that begins around 11 years old, an increase in uh, the size of the genitalia, pubic hair, armpit hair. You start to see that cracking of the voice as the voice drops. Um, muscle size begins to increase, facial hair begins to show up. Um, the capacity for fertility is achieved in boys near the onset of puberty because that surge of testosterone that happens at the beginning of puberty for boys also triggers sperm production. So in girls, they may have their period, but getting pregnant might be difficult for some, which is not necessarily a bad thing at this stage of the game. For boys, they're ready to go. Um, other things we see in puberty are growth spurts. Um, the growth spurts unfairly start earlier in girls than they do in boys, which is why often in teenage movies where you see young uh, puberty beginning uh, couples dancing on the dance floor. The girl is about four inches taller than the guy. And then by the time they get into um, the second or third year of high school, you see the guys catching up and then taking over. So their growth spurts are a little more dull spurts. Um, the growth spurts start first in the limbs, which is very frequently why we see puberty-associated uh, things like osgood schlatters where there's uh, pain along the shins because the rapid growth pulls the tendons away from the bones because it's happening too fast. Um, bone density um, is impacted by uh, these growth spurts and the onset of puberty. So uh, kids in puberty are at increased risk of bone fracture. Um, they're also more uh, engaged in riskier physical behavior that makes them more prone for risk uh, of fracture. Um, weight changes. There it tends to be an increase in body fat that happens more in girls than in boys. Um, and over time, as muscle mass gets better, the ability to uh, get rid of the body fat uh, changes as lean muscle mass increases. In boys more than girls, we can see in puberty as puberty advances a, an increase in strength, an increase in endurance, and an increase in uh, the young energy that supports organ function, so cardiovascular systems and respiratory systems increase. Um, and then there's a ton of emotional changes. And those emotional changes vary uh, greatly amongst uh, kids going through puberty, and not all of them are bad. Um, many of them are uncomfortable for parents but most of them uh, are productive in terms of uh, becoming independent, self-aware, and so not all of them are challenging or negative. Um, physical conditions that we can look at that can all be treated by the eight extras that are associated with puberty are acne, gynecomastia in boys, anemia, sexually transmitted transmitted diseases, scoliosis. So we can often see that sort of curvature in the spine happening when kids start to grow too fast. 
Vision changes often occur in puberty. Musculoskeletal injuries occur more. Um, in young women, you get uh, dysfunctional uterine bleeding that has to be regulated frequently in puberty where things go uh, wonky in that department that has a lot to do with that ovulatory function regulating. Um, there's a condition called precocious puberty, a medically diagnosable condition called precocious community, and um, these are typically uh, categorized as the physical signs of puberty showing up in Caucasian girls before the age of seven, in African American girls before the age of six, because African American girls typically start their periods sooner than Caucasian girls, and in boys, um, signs of puberty before the age of nine. Um, as those secondary sexual characteristics start to show up, if they show up that early, then there's a sign that something is off, unless that's a familial thing, right? Some families, things just start earlier. Um, early puberty, especially nowadays, is more common in girls than in boys. Um, the causes are not always clear or easy to diagnose, but the things to look for are abnormalities in the gonads, so uh, abnormalities, abnormalities in ovarian function or testicular function. Thyroid problems can be associated with uh, early puberty. Um, other hormonal imbalances can in influence puberty. Genetic conditions can cause this. Um, also, uh, certain kinds of brain tumors or infections in the brain that affect the hypothalamus or the pituitary can also cause this. Um, from a Western medical point of view, the idea is to try to find a way medically to regulate um, sex hormones. And usually they use um, hormones that agonists that block hormonal processes so that they could regulate things. Um, it's kind of, kind of a scary thing to start pumping gonadotropin, releasing hormone agonists into kids who are coming into bloom, but it, it is a way of regulating the symptomology. Um, we look at delayed puberty as a marker in boys for no increase in testicular volume by age 14. Um, so if the testicles haven't grown in size by 14, we start looking at a delay in this process. Um, no breast development in girls by 13 and a half. Um, once again, unless there's some sort of genetic thing. I mean, some of us don't ever get breasts <laughs> to speak of, um, and certainly some girls, and it's not really abnormal, haven't really developed more than just budding breasts by the time they're 15 or 16. That, that doesn't really come until later. But if there's no sign of breast budding by the age of 13 and a half, then doctors start considering a delay in this process, um, unless there's a family norm here. Um, if there's a family norm, it's usually a constitutional thing and it sorts itself out eventually. You don't have to really do anything about it. Medical conditions that are associated with the delay in puberty are diabetes, which is on the rise in children. Adult onset diabetes is on the rise in children and this tremendously infect, affects puberty. Cystic fibrosis can do this. There are genetic conditions that uh, get in the way of this. Um, ovarian testicular problems can get in the way of this. Malnutrition can delay puberty. And it's important to remember that malnutrition isn't just not getting enough to eat, it's not getting enough nourishment from what you're eating, right? So there are plenty of kids that are getting lots of calories, but they're not nutritious. And because they're not nutritious, it impacts the hormonal balance. Also in girls, strenuous exercise. Um, you, you know this commonly, like the Olympic gymnasts delay puberty for years beyond what would be considered normal because they have very low body fat and 
They build a lot of lean muscle and it um, impacts hormonal function. This is also one of the reasons why in fertility we tell some women they need to gain a little weight. That if they want to get pregnant easier, that having a little extra body fat will, will help. Um, so same thing here. Girls that don't have that body fat often struggle for the hormonal balance. So when we look at this from an eight extra point of view, um, I run into a little ethical issue from my perspective. I've been using these vessels for a very long time and to me they have a really very, very, very powerful impact on curriculum. And so it's my preference. This is not the rule of thumb with the eight extras. This is simply my preference. I don't like to use the eight extras on kids before they make it through the second cycle of Jane. I, I want their constitution to unfold as naturally as it's supposed to unfold. So it's never my first thought to use the eight extras in puberty. I always try to use um, something that impacts ying chi to resolve problems in puberty as much as I can. And the only time I'll go to the eight extras is if that other stuff doesn't work and it becomes apparent that this is a sort of deeper problem. Um, because early on, you don't really know if this is constitutional or not. You don't know if this is normal or not for things to be delayed or for things to be early. It could be just how this family works. And so if you try to get in the way of it, then you are changing the course of that. And so I like to stay away from that as much as possible. But I will say that if you decide you need to do an eight extra uh, treatment on somebody who's struggling with puberty, that the transporters are a better way to do that because they don't, um, they don't directly influence that first ancestry where the constitution and curriculum resides. It's just a way of creating movement circulation that facilitates movement through the, the challenge. And so I will often look at the way vessels or the child vessels for this if what I'm doing from a primary point of view isn't working. The way vessels are profoundly useful with the emotional stress that's associated with puberty and they can be used to help kids maintain continuity of self through that change. So it's a way of helping them hold it together where they, when they feel like they're going crazy. Um, the child vessel, um, the child very good with dealing with the physical terrain of what happens in the body in puberty. Um, so musculoskeletal injuries, um, postural changes, um, the child vessels are very, very good at this. At this. Um, I don't like to go to the first ancestry in kids unless there's something really, really serious happening here. Um, in most cases, I think puberty should just be left alone to unfold however it unfolds because sometimes the emotional struggle that goes with puberty is supposed to happen. It's how we learn stuff. So I'm really only going to be intervening if there's it, there's more a sort of depth of crisis with puberty that you can't just write off as being, oh, this is what happens to people in puberty.